Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Broadcast Network. My name is Ted Kafales and I work as the Director of Strategic Campaigns at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. I'll be filling in today for our regular host, Dr. Kili'i Akina. As many of our viewers know, Hawaii is currently dealing with a critical housing shortage. Governor Josh Green has made it a point of his administration to increase the number of homes that are available to local families. The governor and his administration have also issued several emergency proclamations related to home building and permitting. But is there a role that our churches, synagogues, and other religious institutions can play in all of this? And if so, what would that really look like? A few weeks ago, we hosted a guest to discuss California's Yes in God's Backyard Law, which will streamline and relax housing regulations for religious as well as educational groups in order to build housing in the state of California. Well, today I'd really like to dig deeper into this topic with someone that knows the ins and outs of building housing for nonprofit religious groups in Hawaii. My guest today is the Reverend Joshua Hayashi, the CEO of Mission Management Company a group that focuses on helping churches build housing on their land. Josh is also a middle school chaplain at Punahou School, and in the past he's also worked with the YMCA of Honolulu and the First Baptist Church of Vancouver, Canada. He has a Master of Divinity degree from Regent College in Vancouver, Canada. Good afternoon, Josh. Thank you for joining me on the show. We're really excited to have you today. Thank you so much, Ted. It's great to be here with you folks. and. I'm excited we're going to talk about this really important and I think maybe un unknown or underutilized topic of these these properties that these churches and nonprofits own. And I, I think that if if people knew how strategic these properties were, and 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 really I, I think the game could change about how we talk about affordable housing, we're able to utilize some of that. Yeah. So before we start, could you kind of Tell me the story behind mission management and, and you know, how you guys got started. So a couple of things. So I'm ordained to the United Church of Christ, which is, you know, a large denomination here in Hawaii. So it's churches like Kauai Ha'o Church, Central Union Church, Makiki Christian Church, and Waiola Church in Lahaina, and Lihui, this church in Lihui, and Kapa'a, and every little town that was, um, that's part of our legacy and our world here. And the reality is that there are about 150, 160 churches in our denomination across the state, across the islands. And there are only four ordained ministers under the age of 60 who are from Hawaii. Wow. And so there, there's one thing there that the need to think about doing things a little bit differently is pretty significant. And that's just one denomination. That's not the Lutherans and Presbyterians and the Catholic Church. But also... Um, it's also the knowledge that there are so many church properties that that are out there. And so if you, you know, just kind of thinking about it, if you were to add up all the church properties across the state, from the Mormons to the Catholics to the United Church of Christ, and you put them all into one lump, it would be in the top five of individual landholders in the state. So it's quite a significant amount. And it's and it's also what's also important is that most of our churches especially in the UCC, are in populated areas. They're at the center of every little town, whether it's Laupohohoi or it's Kapa'a or Waimea or Kaunanakai. It's at the center of all of these places. And so um, it has very strategic, it has a lot of strategic importance as well. And so for me, um, I was in the process of getting ordained at a church called Mikiki Christian Church, right across from McKinley High School in Honolulu. And it is in the shape of a Japanese castle. It's the only Japanese castle outside of Japan. And they have this huge, incredible, beautiful property that's on the state historic register. And they're trying to figure out how do, what do we do with this? Our insurance bill continues to go up. We have termites. We have all of these deferred maintenance issues. And, as a, it, and it's also simultaneously, they ask that question when everything in Kaka'ako is going up. So that question about what could possibly happen, the uh, Makiki, was open to a discussion. And so we started to give them options about how about we had a partnership with these developers or in this kind of a way and, and really helping the churches see that there could be something different about their properties themselves. 
And so that has kind of gone on to be able to kind of look at different properties, bringing partnerships together. Um, we're doing about 80 units of affordable housing in Wailuku town, across from City Hall. So it'd be the equivalent of the old Mission Houses Museum um, property in Honolulu. It'd be the equivalent of that in Wailuku. And um, we're in permitting right now. And we have a partnership between the church landowner, between a developer, the county gave a million dollars, the state gave um, 350,000. So people are really excited about the types of potential in these partnerships. Sure, that's absolutely, that's very exciting. And, you know, you obviously work in a unique part of this building industry. And, you know, I, I would expect there aren't many other companies that focus on doing what you guys are doing and helping churches and religious institutions putting housing on their land. Uh, how did you get from being a reverend pastor to now being a, a CEO in, in your part life? um in helping this mission management company and, and how did you get involved in the development home building side of things well i mean I, I think it's funny i don't consider myself part of the building industry but i do feel like um a lot of the work that i have to do is kind of build these bridges mentally and emotionally and theologically right and and helping us rethink what do we do with our space and this is the hardest part here is that the, the building world whether it's at you know the construction side, whether it's on the lending side, whether it's on the real estate end, commercial and residential, um, on the fund, the large funding end, they only operate on a single value, and that value is called highest and best use. The highest and best use—that's really maximizing value, the financial value out of a property. Now, churches and nonprofits do not operate on that value system. And so oftentimes they're really, the challenge is really on, on the front end, the philosophical end about why. Why should these landowners that are not driven by profit, why should they develop? And what, what is that, whatever that happens next, how is it connected to their mission? So what I'm really excited about is being able to connect mission um, to future projects. And so churches can have mission and they can have some form of sustainability and if they are able to bring those two things together, then something special can happen. One, one of the things I'm really excited about is that because churches don't necessarily need the same return on investment on these projects than a private landowner. And so the ability to do something with that extra um, value becomes highly, highly valuable and important. So. So that, that's what is, what is really interesting here. They don't need the same amount on the back end like everybody else. And so we can use that little extra to be able to kind of share that with the community to make the prices a little lower, to negotiate more with, you know, with different partners. And so I think something special can happen in, in that way. But for me personally, I think it was really seeing several things. Churches um, get taken advantage of by developers because a lot of the churches don't have the bandwidth anymore to be able to kind of make these decisions. And, sure. and I think because they aren't able to make those kind of connections between value and cash and, and look at the long-term effects of that. And so I saw churches getting taken advantage of in one end, but also I saw the, the needs in, in Hawaii on, on the other end increase. And I, it just makes sense, right? Like if the churches have the ability to be able to connect their values, their mission to real needs, then, then something can happen. Yeah, and, and we are absolutely glad that you are taking the reins there and, and helping some of these nonprofit religious organizations just try to navigate some of the difficulties that comes with, whether it's um, working with uh, home builders and getting projects up or, or working with the government uh, bureaucratic officials to get permits and, and whatnot. Uh, but let's just say I, I'm let's pretend I'm on the, uh, the board for a religious group that's interested in putting housing on its land. What's kind of your sales pitch for mission management to, to get me to uh, to build more units on my property? So so first and foremost, we have a, a thing called an audit. And so churches can go and, and put in some of their financial information, put in some of their property information and put in some of their organizational information. And it can really give them a handle on what can actually happen. And so because there's so much conversations about like so many conversations right now about like, oh, everybody, all these churches should build affordable housing. But 
Do they really understand the zoning? Do they really understand what they are financially capable of doing? Can they take on a construction loan? What kind of partners should they have? And so what we ask first and foremost is the conversation about values has to happen first. What's more important, the long-term needs? Is it the short-term needs? Is it mission? Is it preserving Sunday morning? Is it making sure that you're able to kind of keep the roof over your heads? Is it fixing up this property? We don't even talk about cash and the, the value part until we have these much more important conversations about what is the long-term goal for this place? Is it about that we continue to have the Sunday morning service? Those are the kinds of questions we get through first because then it gives the churches what they're really good at, which is talking about values. And if they can identify their values, then we can say, well, let's try and find a partner that shares those values, but can follow this these financial guidelines to make those values happen. Wow, so we need to have the data first, and then we take them through a process. And then, then, then they have the upper hand on negotiating. Instead of the developer telling them, I'm going to give you this X for this amount. The churches don't have a way to kind of actually take that through a system or a structure of decision making. Right. I, and that is definitely something that is well needed. As I mentioned earlier, it's great to have a group that's kind of helping these organizations out and um, just just helping hold their hand a little bit and getting through some of these um, difficulties because it, it is inherently confusing. Uh, but as we talk more about mission management, I, I am. I'd love to hear more about your company's success stories and, and what are maybe one or two of the projects that you've worked on that, that have really addressed that critical community need in, in terms of housing? Yeah, so, well, housing, we're working, the, the Wailuku project is the one we are most excited about. And so we are very, very close to getting through the State Historic Preservation Department. But um, the one of the other things that we've been doing was not so much housing, but we were able to create a partnership that allowed Soto Academy was a, a private school in the social, Soto Mission on Nuuanu Avenue. And for some reason, they were, they're, they're having to exit out of their home. Hmm. Their, their home. They were out of Soto Mission, that the Buddhist temple there on Nuuanu. And so we found them a temporary home so they didn't have to close at Makiki Christian Church, which ended up being a win for everybody. So that's one. Another one was a preschool that was looking to expand in Kalihi, Lovakeki. And they were meeting at, um, at another... Um, I think it was a Shinto church uh, right off the freeway, but they were growing and expanding and they're looking for another forever, forever home. And then we were able to find a place where they can grow and they can continue in Kalihi Monagua. So a lot of the work in some ways is like matchmaking these nonprofits or other organizations that need the space with the entities that do have the spaces themselves. So those are two success stories that we have on that are immediate. The rest of it, as you know, is a lot of these really long games on, development development partners and um we've been having we've been having groups um now contact us from all over the country i had, I had a group in cincinnati ohio a church in cincinnati ohio we helped them start get their commercial kitchen going and be able to get um multiple partners in there so they have a separate in, income stream coming a, a church in Kenai, which is the i think the one we're really excited about on the road to hana this little hawaiian village with this church right in the center of it. They were down to their last three members and um, the roof in their church started to fall. And so we were able to kind of create some momentum within the church by having the granddaughters of these last three aunties come back. And and through working with them and coming up with the financial performa, thinking of what they need, what they did was they created, one of them created a business that's a farmer's market that's capturing the tourist um, traffic in KNI. And from one day of that farmer's market, so in farm mar farmer's market once a month, they are able to pay, to be able to make money, but also to pay for all the church's expenses. And so like that's what, they, and keep bring business into the local town because most of the vendors were all members of the, of the community as well. So it's really helping these churches think of, of creative solutions, mission focused creative solutions um, and using their properties in all different kinds of ways. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. And it truly seems like it's creating a community-based form of housing where you have people that are creating almost like these businesses where they live and work and, and play. So that that is amazing. You know, I, I touched on it earlier, 
and about the uh, governmental regulations. And, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts um, and, and just characterizing some of the state and, and city regulatory environment, but then also going through and, and just touching on, you know, how many city and, and state approvals do you typically need to, to get housing built on a typical church property? So we'll start with that one first. You know, th there are some challenges with a lot of our churches in building. First of all, most of them are historic, right? They're old, they would fall under the State Historic Preservation um, Department's rules that are anything built before 1965 or something. I forget the exact year. It requires specific um, work. So that's, that's a big hurdle that we have to hit. A lot of our properties have graves on them. So A, we will never be able to touch any of, any of those. Um, and so those are two kind of inherent challenges in that. That not, not all the properties are like that, however. But I think the biggest challenge, it's the mental model. And I, I think, and the first mental model is that um, it's the highest and best use thing. The county and state are not, they are really geared towards protecting these properties and the land against these developers that will just max value out and have historically taken advantage of our communities. This is not like that at all. These are nonprofits that have been part of the community for like 200 years. One of the things that has been wonderful is that our, you know, the, these, the aunties can go out and talk to their Congress people or talk to their representatives and say, this is what we want to do. This is to help the community. It's not like some guy coming from California with his suit and say, hey, we're here to build housing for all of you folks. And everyone kind of winks about that. But I think it's a very different thing. It's really from the individual members of the community that's driving it. And so the mental model is different. So it, we're not doing this, and no one is getting rich off of this. And I think that's one of the big challenge for a lot of our, um, for the regulatory system is set up to, to prevent that kind of predatory behavior, but it's making it impossible for everybody because we can't, we can't pay those exorbitant fees that like Black Sand can or like, you know, Kobayashi group can, like we, we don't have the time to take these things. A lot of our churches are in real financial distress. And so their run, runway is not that long. And so in order for things that people to happen, um, Yigbi would be a big help. And so like, like for example, like to get through state historic preservation, to get past that, the some of these things, now we will never build on graves, but it will take time, if not years to get through that. And then the, the other mental model that's the challenge is that, and this is probably the more important one, affordable housing, what we typically do affordable housing, it would put that outside of the center, right? Kalihi, we put it out in, in the, you know, out by Wahiwa, we put that out in Ivile, right? Our churches are in the most prime places. And we think actually that's a gift. Something special could happen, not, not like putting poor people, but we make this a community again that everybody deserves to have a place here. Not, and that includes those who need the most support. And so that, that's the bigger challenge is a lot of people, we're giving our most prime properties to affordable housing, if the church is allowed to do that. And um, I, I think that's gonna be part of the, the hurdle that we get over. That already is actually. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, I, I know you touched on it a little bit, but, a lot of times we hear from folks about the lengthy delays in the permitting process and how oftentimes any kind of delays, quite frankly, will add to costs when it comes to home building and, and developing. Um, can you speak to your experience with the Honolulu permitting process? Have you guys faced any sort of delays when you're working on projects that something like a yes in God's backyard bill might be able to, um, to fix? Oh yeah, I mean, I can think of like five or six projects right now that <laughs> that would be, you know, would be able to kind of sail through because of that. Um, now, the one that we are most furthest along is in Maui, so it's Maui County, and so it's it's similar. And um, but yes, so the State Historic Preservation Department, the Cultural Cultural Resources Commission, um, those are two of the the regulatory entities that we've had to get through on on the County Council. We have full support. From from the um, from Maui County Council, or at least from at least from our folks, who've had a ton of support, and but it is it it is I mean obviously COVID and now with the fires, 
it's it has affected quite a bit. But just by the county, Maui County willing to give us a million dollars to a church to build affordable housing, that has been helpful. But at the same time, it's taken us four years to get to this point because the state historic or the preservation department in, in planning does not want these churches to do to change because it is so so key for it to look the same. The reality is that if they if we now on the other side of it, if they don't allow churches to kind of figure out what to do with these properties and would be willing to do different things, some of these properties will be abandoned, like churches on the mainland, and become blight. And that I know it seems hard to to think of that, but there are six to seven thousand churches closing their doors every single year on the mainland, and wow. that's that's going to be happening to us more and more. Certainly. I mean, as we see more and more churches throughout the state are, are seeing declines in, in membership, um, you know, a lot of them don't have a lot of the cash available to, to build housing. And we've already talked about some of these regulatory delays that, that increase costs. But have any of your clients, uh, any kind of these religious organizations decided against building these affordable housing units? because of the uncertainty associated with the permitting process or, or the length yes. of delays. Yes, for sure. So we had um, we had one project in Waipahu that, um, they, they, because the church wants to retain ownership of the, prop, of, of the property and not and do a lease, then our partners through the, um, through the LIHTC process and how they raise capital would have taken them six or seven years to go through the regulatory process. Mm -hmm. Then most of the churches said we don't we can't do that because we won't live even due to their age to be able to see it happen. Wow. If, and so to think six or seven, and these are large multi-billion dollar national entities that have the bandwidth to do it, maxing out. And six or seven was a conservative um, number of years. So the church said we can't do it because we won't last. Sure. And there's another one in Kailua similar to that. Yeah, that's like, certainly understandable. I mean, six to seven years, that I don't know any kind of organization that can wait that long. Um, you know, we've kind of, now Josh, we've, we've skirted around and we've briefly touched on California's new Yes in God's Backyard law. Um, we actually discussed it here on the show quite recently. In Hawaii, there was a similar bill, I believe it was HB 814, was proposed uh, earlier this year that would have allowed nonprofit, religious, educational, and healthcare organizations to build housing on their property by right. And essentially that means without discretionary, discretionary state or, or city approvals. Do you think that kind of approach is going to help companies like yours? Yes, I think it would significantly. Um, and I, I think I, I think it would be helpful. It's also, I mean, just the, it also makes it a little bit, we don't want it to be these other predatory groups to be there as well, but I think it would help a lot because it would allow these churches, like I said, time is really of the essence for them. They are running out of time quickly. And unless we are able to mobilize on some of these properties in less than six or seven years, then they will be abandoned or sold. And what I tell churches is that we, we don't want to sell because it does three things. One, it, one, it, it jacks up the property values. Number two, it makes a public mm -hmm. space into a private one. And number three, like real estate is at the heart of all injustice on the planet. In, in the way that we currently think about real estate. And so this is a way for us to make a move to, to make Hawaii equal. And I think we have the opportunity to, to really bring some change. And, and we would say like there are some spiritual values that we want to drive of everybody coming together. Sure, sure. And, and you know, in order to kind of expedite that process and just help to to navigate it, do you guys coordinate with state or city housing officials on any kind of specialized projects that you're proposing just to uh, expedite the process, as I mentioned? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things, the million dollars that we got from Maui County was attached, attached to the experimental um, housing ordinance. I forget what, what state bill is or state law it is. It is right off, off the top of my head, but it was with the express intent that this would be an example for other churches to make these kinds of partnerships. Because let's say, you know, like Wailuku, there are five churches within uh, 500 yards of each other. Five church properties. 
Mm-hmm. Honolulu is a significant amount, right? Like Kapa'a is, is like that. Lihui is like that. And I think that the bigger challenge that we have often thought that it, that housing in Hawaii is going to be like a one big fix, right? Like going to build these huge 5,000 unit entities. But really, we think that it's going to be these smaller boutique things that, that create community, walking, multi, multi-use. multi And that's what we're hoping for, is that these smaller boutique properties can really create something special. Sure, Definitely. You know, we've, we've done a lot of talking about a yes in God's backyard bill or a Yigby bill, but are there any other sorts of reforms that could help religious or other nonprofit organizations to build on their land? Um, I think that would be the, the Yigby is, a, is to me is the best place to start because it gives us hope because we can't compete with with those folks. Um, but I think being able to have. To create ways for um for OCS, for grants from the state to be able to go to these properties and to these churches, I mean, with the right controls, obviously, then I think that that could help. Um, we have to create some separate legal stuff so that one of our churches could receive OCS grants or state level grants. Um, but also, this is a way for the communities to come together. I, I, I can't think anything offhand about any other type of bill specifically, but um, the Yigby is, is going to be the, is a, to me, it's the dream situation. If we could do that, something could really happen. That's great. That's great. Anything else that, that you'd like to add today? And I think the big part is that Hawaii is changing at a fundamental level. I mean, it always has been, but the, it's important for us to kind of have to work together to be able to keep us moving forward together and doing some of these things that may seem challenging or hard because we have to do it. We have to do it to make Hawaii livable for the next generation. If we don't, it's it's going to be impossible. That certainly resonates with us here at the Grassroot Institute. Our our motto is a hanakako, which, as many people know, means let's work together. So that is a fantastic note to end on, Josh. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Again, Reverend Josh Hayashi with the Mission Management Company. Uh, we. Thank you for your time. And until next time here on the ThinkTech Broadcast Network, my name is Ted Kafalis signing off. Take care.